Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Urea Insurance Podcast. I'm your co-host, Jared Lee. And I'm Ben Rose. Hello, everyone. Welcome back, sir. Thank you. I've, I've just come up with a startling analogy. Out of the gates. Yeah. Straight, straight into it. Do you, so do you remember, Cordy was actually, I don't remember if you were in this conversation. You might have been sat next to us on the phone yeah. before you were in it, but I have with me. I don't know if the studio audience can see. <laughs> I'm, were you there? Are you getting where this is going? No, I don't know. Okay. I've got a coffee cup yeah. with some coffee inside it, yeah. and they did for me that wonderful milk art that I yeah. thought had been stenciled on because I'm an amateur when it comes to <laughs> coffee things. And Cordy You're not a barista. Me, no, no, it's done with the art of the pour, yeah. and they actually pour the milk to land in this way so as yeah. to create a leaf effect, yeah. which is quite impressive. I, but then Cordy showed me how to do it on YouTube, and I was like, ah, I appreciate the craftsmanship, but also maybe I could learn to do this too. Uh -huh. uh, anyway, long <laughs> random analogy to be explained here is that we're going to also be talking about something today which is an art at its heart uh, but from the outside is often perceived with a bit of mystery as to where the value actually lies where the skill <laughs> comes in you see where i've taken this <laughs> i do it's so, a stretch of an analogy yeah. but i appreciate so it so which dark art will we be interpreting today Jared? today it's the dark art of reinsurance broking um, <laughs> a very caffeinated endeavor, I'm sure, by many. Absolutely. Well, at least we're approaching it safe. Uh, well, I say relatively safe away from some of the busiest times of the year, but we are getting back into <laughs> yeah. busy summer kind of renewals now. Yeah. Um, but yes, we wanted to dive into actually an article that you've penned recently, uh, which I was delighted to discover ChatGPT had no involvement in as ever. No. Uh, we're both staying true to our guns there <laughs> yeah. despite cordy's suggestion that we could save time by interacting with it yeah uh, we, we've mostly responded to ChatGPT's ideas as stimulus and then being like this is why i disagree with you chat gpt <laughs> and then written our own articles you don't yes. know me robot exactly exactly <laughs> but um but yeah you wrote this very brilliant article on the, the reinsurance brokers uh, and how their sort of value proposition approach to their whole purpose and identity, I guess, has changed yeah. um, over time and how it will change going forwards. And referencing one of my favorite technology books. I, speaking of technology, someone's calling me during a podcast, which is very bad. I should put my phone on. <laughs> but tell us about your article. Um, yeah, so the article, it will have a link to it here um, for those who want to read it, but it was essentially setting out the sort of third wave sort of philosophy. It was a, a concept built by Toffler originally with sort of how civilizations work, um, but then reused for, by Steve Case, who's sort of the founder of Yahoo back in the day, um, about the, th the three ways of technology. And it sort of establishes this, how I interpreted it and what the article goes on to talk about is that first wave is like the foundations that these industries and these technologies and these um, sort of products in our industry start with. And it's establishing the core foundations and why a function begins to emerge. Um, the second wave then is sort of leaning into once it's the foundations have been established, sort of how you do those same tasks, but more efficiently. Um, but then once you get to a certain level of efficiency, you begin to embrace this sort of net new opportunity. I deemed it new horizons, but, you know, that was the advent of, of data and information age in Toffler's view. And then in Steve Case's view, this lens of how technology began to move from impacting just the digital online world, but how it would transform the world that we interact with and sort of looking at what the future of reinsurance broking might be. Um, yeah. So yeah, it was a, a fun little analogy that ChatGPT did not able, to, wasn't able to sort of extract from my brain. <laughs> yeah, they're not going to win the analogy battles. <laughs> they will not, no, exactly. So We're seasoned to pros. Is it they, it? Are there many instances of ChatGPT? I don't know how we refer to it. It's probably just one person behind a computer. Omnipresent force. <laughs> Um, especially for us, we get our own dedicated reinsurance chat GPT advisor. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the book, as you said, the, the concept brilliantly applied by Steve Case when in his version of events, um, that first wave, as you said, the foundational wave, all about effectively creating a working internet. Yep. <laughs> like, like how, how do you have a, a world wide web? How do you have all of these core systems? How do you get emails working? How do you get yeah. basic forms of interaction to get this so that uh, anything can even begin to be possible. That then, building on that, some of the low-hanging fruit in the second wave, uh, yeah. all of these early big tech stories that we hear about, uh, 
the WhatsApps, the Facebooks, mm -hmm. the, the things that are relatively straightforward for the, the ordinary person to imagine and are unlocked purely by virtue yeah. of digitalness. Yeah. And then the third wave, as you said, is probably the most relevant to insurance and reinsurance, which is, okay, how do you almost turn the equation around and take all of that digital stuff and yeah. apply it to industries with quite high barriers to entry. So I think a lot of the examples he gives are, are things like education, mm -hmm. and, uh, healthcare, finance, all these things which are just a mystery to the person on the Clapham omnibus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and it's this, it's this transition from the purely digital. So that, that first wave is like setting up the protocols for, for which the internet can exist, right? And it moves it away from CERN and the sort of purely academic, you know, uh, roots of, of the internet. Um, and then all those first iterations, social networks and file sharing, all these things, like it's just purely digital. It's you have a digital version of yourself or fake versions of yourselves. And it's just this, this interaction. But that transition then at the end is a transition into how it impacts us in real life, how it transforms, you know, consumer behavior and shopping and how you interact with stores, but then also hospitals and transport and things that have a tangible world interaction there. And that's that new horizon that it merged into. Um, for reinsurance broking, the analogy that I that I'd set out was broking emerged to serve a real purpose, right? You had these clients who needed access to capital to protect their business, and the brokers emerged to help understand that risk and then connect them to capital, right? And as as uh, capital diversified itself around the world, and as clients grew around the world, brokers just sort of leaned into that and got bigger, and it was that foundational role that they played in the industry. Um, as risk got more complicated, that second wave was just doing that same work, but a lot better, right? And this is better understanding the risk, using things like cap models and this type of stuff to understand what the client was trying to solve for, their ambitions for um, how they'd allocate and protect their capital, um, understanding the, the, de, uh, the demands and desires of the reinsurers, what types of business did they want, and using that matching to help them connect with the best clients and, and vice versa to get better pricing. Um, and that was all really transformative, and you saw the brokers leaning into their evolving model, right? We talked previously about uh, how sophisticated the brokers are getting now, like the number of brokers who are ex-actuaries or cat modelers and these things. It's a much, much more sophisticated role than it would have been you know, 15, 20 years ago. And as we go into this new third wave, now that that's the, the starting point that we're at, you know, what will we do as data is getting vastly better and they can do more compute power is getting incredibly high. So what brokers will be able to do for their clients, the speed by which they'll do things, the structures they'll be able to create, will begin to create this net new world in which it has similarities to the, you know, the stages before, but begins to be the sort of new horizons. Yeah, absolutely. And the way I kind of think about some of this, again, unsurprisingly from a bit of a tech lens, uh, is you had the breakers in the first wave, you know, almost doing it by hand. I yeah. very much network, personal network driven. Who have you got in your roller decks? Who can you meet for lunch and persuade to take on some of your clients deal? Uh, designing a structure, you know, and working it out with a calculator. Uh, that moving on then to, and I'd say with the, with the exception of cat models here, which is sort of a special case that mm. necessarily emerged to support property, mostly from a workflow basis using quite generic tools to get the job done. Mm -hmm. So it was, a, oh, all of this stuff has arrived in the form of Microsoft Excel uh, and its pre predecessors and uh, yeah. email. You know, you're starting to be able to send emails and attachments and to use FTP sites. Um, really using tools that were not designed for this much more specialized industry mm -hmm. but trying to harness a little bit of the digital that was available generically to society at large and for me this third wave starts to take place when you say okay now digital is a thing now we've got this opportunity where uh you know technology companies can focus specifically on a given sector and say okay what are the problems affecting you education you healthcare you yeah. reinsurance that enables that third wave to take place in terms of specifically the pain points experienced by a reinsurance broker when they're trying to track 
you know, 50 different lines per layer on yeah. a giant treaty or if they're trying to um, consistently aggregate the underlying portfolio information for yeah. their clients. That has not been tackled by, no. you know, a, a gaffer member, you know, yeah. like Google setting out and saying, what should we do today? Well, this reinsurance industry looks like it's yeah. going to be pivotal to our earnings report. They're not. You need specialists and specialists have only been able to emerge, I think, because of the almost second post second wave yep. availability of foundational server access uh, yeah. SaaS solutions for small businesses yeah. venture capital all these kind of confluence of factors enabling tech companies to focus on those sort of more specific market network problems yeah well i think that ubiquity of technology is is that big driver right and there was a, a really good piece written a number of years ago now by, by ben evans about sort of debundling craigslist and and the, the idea at a whole is that what used to be sort of this repository of anything you wanted you could buy things you could rent things you could you know meet people you could like offload stuff for free donate stuff and over time, all these like little pages on Craigslist became their own companies and their own standalone apps. But because it began to emerge that actually when you wanted to rent your home, you wanted people who were coming in to specifically do that. And it was actually a better experience for an entire company or website to exist just for home rental and couch surfing or buying you know used products and and they could build better experiences specifically tailored for what that buyer and seller needed i think you can use that same then analogy in our industry where before it was we can use microsoft excel for everything and it, it's sort of a jack of all trades thing but technology has begun to emerge that's allowing people to invest and build specific things that say well, for the specific problem that I'm trying to solve for in this, you know, exact kind of client, yeah. I need all of these things. And instead of going, but I only have these very generic tools, you're seeing this development because those standards have been established. You can then go, we're going to build or buy tools specifically designed to fix and target these pain points. Um, and I think you're seeing this real emergence now as to what does that allow you to do next, mm -hmm. right? And it begins to transition and change, you know, economies or businesses and these types of things. And, and it's amazing, isn't it? If you look at the world around us, the level of specificity that some of the technology has gone to. If, to mm -hmm. take your exact example, I, you know, Craigslist or, or an eBay or Amazon or something like that. Imagining, you know, putting your, your house on one of those sites, yeah. you know, to sell it or your car or... Uh, trying to buy insurance or, or similar, the, the exhibits, the underlying evidence that you want for those things is so fundamentally different yeah. each time that it, it just feels very strange to imagine going to a place that's so generic as those for, for those kind of services. I think about, I, I mean, a bit UK biased from my experience, but I, the Zooplas and the Right Moves, mm. Zillow in the US for mm. homes where you now have uh, not just floor plans included as part of the thing, but school checkers, energy efficiency ratings, uh, nearest transport, mortgage calculators. Yeah. Uh, I think they're called dollhouses, like 3D kind of oh, models yeah. that you can play with and like see how the whole house is built yeah. and like sort of cycle around it. Similarly, in, in the car world, you know, if you're shopping for a car, an auto trader, it'll give you, you know, rapid number plate checks. It'll tell you the 0 to 60, the yeah. fuel economy, the width and height and length of the car, and all, all sorts of things um, that would be just so difficult to codify or usefully aggregate in a way that you could provide insight if you were also trying to tackle the needs of somebody who wanted to sell a computer yeah um or who wanted to you know share information relating to yeah. a fundamentally different set of uh, products or services yeah. and i think uh, i i'm not sure if it's the same article but actually ben evans goes on to expand it to also the importance of the participants in that market mm. creating this kind of market network around it so not only have you got a a set of tools and services that are built directly for that audience connecting you know the the various parts of the market mm -hmm. so in our case it'd be student broker reinsurer but on top of that uh, you also have that dedicated audience who are finding valuable partners through the specificity of the site and cutting out the noise uh, of other people i know we always find this when we apart from baden baden and monte carlo and a, a couple of others you know if you go to an insurance conference it's like I think I saw somebody with re on their name badge at the back. Yeah. But like 90% of the people you see are not 
our audience, and I'm sure reinsurance people encounter this all the time walking around the city. It's like, you must see loads of people you know. And it's like, you do, yeah. but fewer because you're looking for that you know, smaller 10% of right. people who are in the reinsurance world, which yeah. I think merits that more focused audience. Yeah. No, it's, um, it's a really interesting thread because the other thing that we have in our space is you're trying to get the best sort of price. You're trying to get the best outcome of of the sale you're trying to execute right and those experiences can make that very you know easily to digest for listeners and viewers right where if you wanted to list your home you can put it in a craigslist ad with a little blurb and maybe one photo or you can put it in this website designed with, with all these data points and the 3d models of the homes and all the additional support and documentation and all of that like it's very obvious in which of those experiences you're going to get the best outcome that you're trying to buy, both as a buyer and a seller, right? And we think about data in our space and the future of broking and everything looks at these same sorts of things. The data included now in submissions, right? The, uh, uh, Paul Gadsby, who was on the podcast a while ago, um, talked about the, it used to be called just information packs mm -hmm. and now it's called data packs. And that's subtle, but that's important because it was previously just kind of a description of what is happening here. But that's no longer good yeah. enough. And so that second, that first transitional peer period, that second wave was moving away from just telling me about the risk to like showing me about mm -hmm. this risk, giving some weight behind what's happening, evidence to me what this is, book is doing. Um, this third wave now will go a step further than that where it won't just be give me a data pack that has the kind of basic exhibits and maybe year over year comparisons in a table I can't interrogate, but will be something where there's an increased demand to go, ooh, you've not shown me as much as I'm used to seeing elsewhere. If you go to buy a house and they've got two photos, there's a lot you feel you don't know now. That same transition will begin to be the one that we're seeing in reinsurance where the expectation will just increase, where you're going to have a huge amount of demand as to going well if i can't drill in to see which specific policies make up these bands or if i can't see year over year comparisons you know in a in an instant something is happening here where everyone else is showing me all of this mm -hmm. and i'm getting this sort of one photo version of of your data which doesn't give me as much confidence yeah. so it's those things i think will be part of driving this transition you know what what i think has gone wrong here for the industry historically mm -hmm. is actually enthusiasm to its credit that brokers have sort of tried to go straight for that third wave mm -hmm. without the foundational transitional elements required towards the end of the second wave right the, yep. there's an enablement of shifting from a uh, generic digital to sp specialized digital tools yep. that requires you to have your industry's house in order so to speak because doubtless brokers individually and collectively within their firms have a huge amount of value to add with more specific services that you know should be tailored and should be unique mm -hmm. uh, likewise reinsurers when you get further down uh, the chain you know special ways of analyzing data and taking into account their own portfolio etc mm -hmm. however none of that can happen if the data going in is garbage yep and until we have as an industry embraced a sufficiently consistent standard of input data, we can't move to that third wave. I think that's why we find ourselves on this very important mission, you know, to try and help collect the industry's data, get it into a format where it can actually be ingested properly yeah. and structured so that then when, you know, Broker X decides we want to enhance it with additional third party data or you want to overlay it with this very clever uh, you know, stochastic analysis that nobody else has done before, or whatever it might be, yeah. I, they actually can do that rather than going, ah, we've built the cool thing, but it only works in 5% of cases mm -hmm. after lots of manual cleaning and yeah. wrangling of the data. Well, and, and this too has a technological precedent, right? This, this exact scenario was what was essentially the dot-com bust, where the internet had been established and instead of going through the, the phase two that we saw, which was purely digital experiences as we built up data, people tried to leapfrog that into transitioning and impacting the modern, like the world we interact with, right? Things like pets.com and food delivery and all these things are things that we tried before, 
But to your exact point, we didn't yet have enough sophistication and data around how transport networks would work or how um, we could manage mapping and you, you know real-time data for freight and all these things that were required to make these solutions work. The logistical sophistication required didn't exist. So all these companies went out with this great big dream of how they would transform the modern world by using the internet, but they hadn't just built digital yet, Yeah. right? And the vast majority of those companies collapsed, and the, the few that survived um, that look more modern now were like an Amazon, but again, with a very specific mandate back then, which was all we do is books, or not, cause, and they did books because they're simple to ship, yeah, yeah. Their, their weight is known, their size is easy, their shape is easy, we do that. And then they will have an ISBN number. Right, right. And yeah, inventory is easy. And so th that was one company because their very f narrow focus was able to transition themselves from wave two to wave three. But the most of the companies try to leapfrog that second wave and go straight into, mm -hmm. you know, real time grocery delivery, which is still hard. Yeah. Even in the third wave we're in now is still hard. But in the early 2000s or late 1990s, we were utterly ill-equipped. There was no, we were nowhere near the logistical sophistication to make that work, which is why those companies, you know, hit so hard. And, and case in point, right? so Amazon proved just how much of a barrier there was to overcome in yeah. terms of foundational logistics. In the sense that, by the time they'd got around to supporting their own businesses' server needs, they were like, "Oh wow, we might have." Yep. you know the most sophisticated server set up in the world we should probably sell this as a proposition is too. this valuable <laughs> <laughs> do, do other people also face this challenge and, and you know quickly aws yeah. was born and so it became more profitable than the rest of the business put together because you know that foundational how do you get stuff onto the internet in a secure and and yeah. reliable way was was not an easy challenge to solve so yeah. lots of different important steps being mm. taken at, at various parts of the industry to enable that third wave is no easy feat, but no. it's, I think everybody knows, you know, there is, there is gold at yeah. the end of the gold rush. You've just got to have the right <laughs> shovels. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <clears throat> when, uh, when I sort of end that piece, what I sort of talk about is not that we're in the third wave now, but, but that we're very near to that transitional state. You know, there's an increasing quality of data that's coming out. There's an increasing speed by which that data can be transferred. There's this increasing um, consistency of what is sitting there. And that will begin to unlock that. It's it's almost like now that we have that real-time logistics data and that traffic data and all these things, it will allow us to do X, right, and insert whatever X might look like. Um, but it's it's that recognition that we're coming up to the natural end of wave two and we're touching against what brand new might look like in our space. And I think it's a really, really exciting one. Um, when you look back and compare it to what those other transitional stages were, um, and I think the, the AWS one example is, is great because it highlights that what new and next might look like might be not fundamentally different, but an extension of the core that you didn't necessarily see when you're just focusing on the core, right? And I think... The fact that our industry, it's it gets criticized, I, I think, at times unfairly about moving slowly. But I think that patience around what it needs to be doing and what's delivering impact to clients all the time will be the thing that allows us to, when these things begin to emerge, go, well, now we just want to do this better. And that will very, very quickly accelerate into fundamentally new solutions for clients and things. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think it's a incredible industry to work in if you are one of the participants on a playing field that can move forward collectively right mm. I mean, it's rich really really rich with potential i uh, once we take a step forward you know if we can get enough data structured in the industry if we can get people able to share information via apis etc then the scope for any given sedent broker or reinsurer to differentiate themselves with their own aspects of their proposition is, mm. is really substantial. But that is a prerequisite. You do have to get the data sorted out yeah. first. You have to eat your broccoli. Yeah. Um, and probably you want to automate the eating of your broccoli so you can <laughs> get to dessert as quickly as you can. Yeah, but it's, you know, it's it's funny. It's 
it's not a prerequisite. For the record, I really like broccoli. (laughs) It is delicious. I have tangent time. (laughs) I have a friend who who the other day um, was telling me that they only eat broccoli if it's covered in cheese. Oh, no. But I was like, but you're an adult. (laughs) (laughs) What kind of cheese they? I mean, like. Like melted, like melted. So it wasn't like a. You know, I, I mean, not to disclose too much, but it was melted probably. American cheese. So that should explain yeah. a bit of this, this audience. Yeah. Um, but I, I'll challenge that only a little bit to say it's it's not a prerequisite full stop to move the industry forward. Um, but it's a prerequisite for those companies who want to be the ones moving forward. Right. There's still a load of companies who are like, we just have our high street shop and our website just tells you our address. Yeah. And so like, that's cool. Mm-hmm. You know, you do you. Um, but there are companies who are leaning into that, and I think you have your innovators and those people who want to push the envelope forward and and take advantage of what this is to to grow their organizations or things. So I, I think in all of those cases, absolutely, it's a prerequisite to get the data sorted and so just use that um, the process, the progress we've made in that second wave. But I think there'll be some who will go, nope, this is how we do it, yeah. and we're happy to mail it to you. In a, <laughs> in a cardboard box full of files. And that will be, you know, that will always exist to some to some degree, I suspect. Yeah, it's funny. I think um, I remember chatting with actually a, a, a past CEO of Lloyd's uh, mm-hmm. about the trade-off between I, in the age of, you know, the light bulb's just been invented and you're a candle maker. Yeah. I, do you focus on sort of, squeezing the, f- the fruits out of the remaining candle market for as long as possible and then mm-hmm. become increasingly more artisan and specialized as like the go-to candle maker. Yeah. You can imagine which analogy we were talking about. <laughs> we were talking about Lloyd's in this case. Yeah. Um, or do you say, right, we're, we've got to get to the front of the, the queue from a mm-hmm. light bulb perspective. Um, and it's really interesting. You know, so many parallels. Everybody knows the blockbuster story. Mm-hmm. But like just a couple of weeks ago, we had the the news that Bed Bath and Beyond, for example, mm-hmm. had finally gone bust, and their founder just said, "Yeah, we missed the internet. Basically, mm-hmm. we we were too slow yeah. on that." And there will always be, as you said, a market for uh, those who prefer the inconvenience, almost mm-hmm. the the uh, authenticity of like a handmade option, or yeah. but that is increasingly the premium, non-mainstream option yeah. versus a much smoother automated approach which yeah. i think is always going to have an easier time persuading uh, stakeholder stakeholders of its value versus some of these uh, more artisan approaches but that's the beauty of of different industries well and it's it's kind in many ways the way sort of the the markets guide themselves right it's what do the buyers demand and what do they value Right. And if we if we use books as an example, it's not to say that the future will only be you only get them online from Amazon. because That's the way the world works. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things that surprised me the most when I came to London a decade or so ago, and it still continues to surprise me now, is the how many bookstores thrive in this city and in this country. Right. Like we certainly have Amazon and I use it gratuitously. Yeah. yeah. Um, But. But the number of small, but because those communities and those individuals in this country really values like going to a bookstore and browsing and picking up a couple things, like it's very much a thing that people do. So for this audience, this this type of buyer, they will continue to thrive, even though they know there's a cheaper and possibly more efficient and a you know faster way to get books. There's something that the buyer wants, and I think when we look at reinsurance. You will also have an element of that going, well, we could just do it this way. But that's not really what the buyer wants either. Yeah, and I think what's really interesting here is that the actual implementation of data and technology in that industry then became for competing booksellers who is best able to use data and analytics to be able to predict which books to put where in their store next to each other, et cetera, which ones to have in stock. You've got a small space in like a... Tudor wood paneled, you know, bookshop that attracts in the customers because they want to go get that musty book smell, <laughs> you know, be like, ah, yes, I came here to buy a book. And, oh, look what they've got, yeah. darling. Can you, can you believe they've got this coffee? You know, th- the that's exactly the kind of experience wanted. they want. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, but so much of that is now pre-gamed. And, you know, the reason they always go to 
hatchards versus waterstones or vice mm. versa or, or black wells or you know the, yeah. these shops is because it's like ah oh, they, they've somehow seen inside my soul mm -hmm. and they knew that that's the book that is you know they're perfect for the zeitgeist of our yeah. time i think that's um an unexpected trend when everyone looked at to your point the second wave i uh, dot com style and thought mm. everything will be on the internet yeah and all humans will be made <laughs> redundant it turned out to be completely different right it's like yeah. oh we'll just be much better yeah. at doing the thing we've always done yeah providing well, valuable reinsurance breaking services well, yeah and, and at the end of the article you were uh you're asking before the the show like what was my prediction for where it might go? And I absolutely hedged to be like, the beauty of the third wave is you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but in many ways, that's exactly why I look at it in this way of going, all we're seeing right now is the culmination of things that make this next step inevitable. But it could go in any number of directions. And the excitement that I have as a someone who you know talks about this industry and works in technology in this industry is we can kind of sit there and go, ooh, mm. get the popcorn and let's see what happens, right? Because um, I think you'll see all manner of things that we didn't expect or things that um, we didn't expect to be either as similar as to they are now or as fundamentally different. It could, be, it could go either way. Get your popcorn ready, thanks. Get your popcorn ready. And we'll see you next time. See you next time. That was a strong close. <laughs>